jump right here. So thanks for inviting me. I'm uh, happy to be here. And uh, just to make that clear at first, I'm in, I have no company. I'm not part of any company. I'm even independent from universities. So I will present you some spotlights without any intention to propagandize anything. OK, so uh, <coughs> I better go to the side here. And the lights are really very bright. <coughs> OK, so um, I'm uh, belonging to a very old tradition which has used um, trans states to heal in shamanism, which is a worldwide uh, kind of origin of religion and uh, psychotherapy. They have traditionally used psychoactive substances for thousands of years, so I'm a very conservative uh, physician, so to say. Uh, they used rituals to structure these experiences during these altered states of consciousness. They uh, tried to gain an intensification of emotions and catharsis, so freeing, freeing yourself of emotions which have, uh, might make you heavier than you should be. Um, and there is also a work of integration where you integrate the experience afterwards, which might have be some unusual features. Uh, now to come back to the present, uh, we right now, and that's the reason why psychedelics are coming up again to my eyes, uh, the pharmaceutical industry has realized that since 20 years there's no innovation in their field and since 10 years the pharmaceutical industry is out of business in fact. Means they don't do any research in psychopharmacological agents anymore. That means that university researchers, which are depending on the streaming of money through their departments, don't get any money anymore. And so they go back to the old medication, which I have worked with for more than 30 years right now, but I was thinking I'm lost somewhere. But meanwhile, um, it came up again. So to uh, just give you a few ideas about the history, um, uh, LSD and psilocybin were already medications in the 1950s and 60s uh, until the uh, lay use of uh, psychedelics became a large uh, thing, in, especially in the US, and all these substances were prohibited, which also automatically prohibited research. Um, so the illegal production was going on, and then you know the hippie movement which, were, which was especially large in the US led to all the legislation which has hindered research since that time. And if you look at these statisticals here, uh, it means these are the publications done about these approaches which are called psychedelic therapy or psycholytic therapy. And you can see here in the 50s and the 60s, you have quite a large number of publications and then after that it was going down but never died. Only in 1984, that magical year, there was no publication about these therapeutic endeavors. <clears throat> so we at first uh, go uh, into MDMA, so-called ecstasy, which was originally a psychotherapeutic drug in the late 1970s, but then it became a large dense drug on an international scale. And it is important to realize that MDMA is quite different from substances like LSD and psilocybin in the following respects. It, ha it has virtually no hallucinatory effects as, are typ as they are typical for LSD or psilocybin. The, the, the substance uh, induces much less cognitive alteration, so your thought processes are kind of in order and you could even, in an unusual uh, uh, situation, react like normal, so to say. The, your ego functioning, so your inner psych psychological balances and defense mechanisms are still intact, but you can leave them aside, so to say, for whatever kind uh, you want. And it is a lot of anti-anxiety um, effect, which is called in German more properly Entängstigung. So you go beyond feeling anxious with all your neurotic fears, which are usually regulating also your thoughts about yourself, your self-image, etc. So you can get a diff quite different experience of yourself and of the others during these states of anti-anxiety and opening. It also furthers self-acceptance and empathy for others as well as for yourself. So it sounds really good as a therapeutic agent. 
And this is a typical uh, so-called psycholytic setting where the patient is lying down here and having his eyes closed typically sometimes with a sleeping mask. And here is a tape recording system so that you can uh, rec record what the, what the person is saying and then they write a protocol afterwards and you can discuss it with. Usually one person is there all the time and here Professor Loina, a prominent peop a person in the field, is uh, coming in every hour or so to look out for the patient and how it's going. And then the whole thing changed in the mid 80s to the dance uh, drug MDMA thing. And right now it seems we are back again with uh, therapy. And uh, what uh, was done was a study in PTSD patients, post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you experience something you can't handle, then you might get traumatized like a rape or a war accident or something like that. And these people are usually can't be well treated. A lot of them don't profit from the conventional approaches. And so therefore there are a lot of people out there, I would say more, uh, much more than 30%, which can't be helped by the conventional methods. Especially for example, war veterans in the US where you might know that they do more suicide than are uh, uh, going to die in the field. And uh, what they have done here is, that was the first study ever done with MDMA, and this is um, a certain measure which uh, you measure the PTSD symptoms uh, uh, heaviness with. And what you can see here, this is a placebo treatment, which means just the psychotherapy, which is surrounding the MDMA treatments, was given. And you see it's somewhat going down. And here uh, you see this is a follow-up for three years. So these are the, this is the active uh, treatment period. And right now you see the MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy. After the first, uh, first session, the, person was, uh, the persons were going down. And below 30 is no PTSD anymore. And you see that after the second session and three months later, and the treatment success was quite stable for more than three years. So this is a very successful uh, kind of treatment, which has meanwhile uh, got the breakthrough designation by the American Food and Drug Administration so that we can do the phase three studies, which are the last studies before the drug will be marketed easily uh, and for much less money because of that designation. What are the psychological process, uh, processes which are going on with this psycho, uh, kind of psychotherapy? There's a very deep psychophysical relaxation under the drug. Uh, the people open up and a decrease of anxiety. I've already mentioned that. There's a lot of enhanced imagery going on, especially when the eyes are closed. And a central feature is the reprocessing of traumatic events. I will give you some explanation about that in a few minutes. Uh, you also can gain new perspectives and contexts for your thoughts and for the things which happened in the past, especially if they are problematic. And this is to my eyes, and I've studied this kind of therapy quite a bit. Uh, it is uh, MDMA in psychotherapy is a kind of trust booster. So if you have been raped, you will not be trusting everybody afterwards. You might distrust everybody and you have to be healed from that so that you can behave appropriately again. And so therefore it can be a very good medication because we have no medication which can boost your trust into others, into the world and into yourself. Um, we have also written a book about this kind of uh, treatment, which is the only one uh, up to now. And now I will give you the, an idea how you reprocess um, uh, experiences uh, during an MDMA and you state. So we start by explaining what happens usually if you are seeing and hearing this lecture. So the, the data are coming from the back of your brain into the relay station, which is called the salamus in the brain. Then it goes to the cortex and you think about what's important here, what to think about. Oh, I have to think so about something else. It's not important. So you kind of sort out these things, you select them. And then it goes down to the salamus, to the relay station, and then you, it goes into the memory bank, the so-called hippocampus. That's the usual way how you um, uh, work with uh, impressions. And if you have a traumatized event going on, uh, then these things were not sorted through the cortex and evaluated for their significance. They go directly into the memory bank. This is why people have flashbacks where these experiences are coming back again, or they have nightmares being in the same scenario again, and so on. So it's kind of not worked through, if you want. And uh, therefore, you could imagine that you have a kind of 
retention system in your memory bank which kind of tends to express itself. And so you get flashbacks and all these things. Usually, these memories to come up are hindered by your amygdala, which is a certain part of the brain which you could call the fear center of the brain. And so if these memories are threatening you to come up, then the fear center is going on and suppressing them, right? So that you usually don't experience them. Um, what we have found under the influence of MDMA or MDMA-like drugs is that this is a PET scan, which is a positron emission tomography thing, and you can see metabolism going on in the brain. The, uh, the darker parts are less metabolized, and uh, these ones, uh, the yellow and red ones, are more metabolism is going on. And this is the brain under the influence of MDA, a close relative of MDMA. And what you can see here is the area where the amygdala is. Usually it's kind of activated. And under the influence of MDE, it's deactivated. And now we go back to our uh, graphics again. So the amygdala is usually suppressing your memories. And what happens usually is that your forebrain is able to suppress the amygdala response to a certain degree, but if you have a PTSD, this response or this uh, action activity of the prefrontal cortex is less than usual. So you are more threatened by your memories, so to say. And <clears throat> under the influence of MDMA, this part of the brain is strengthened in its influence on the amygdala, and the amygdala itself is kind of deactivated during that state. And what happens then is that your memories will kind of automatically come up again, but your brain is without anxiety, so you can kind of metabolize it, these memories, and then they go back to the thalamus, then you sort them out and you relive them somewhat, and then it gets ordered into the hippocampus. That's the main mechanism of this uh, kind of therapy. So now we are going uh, shortly to um, psychotherapy with LSD and psilocybin. We also have new trials going on these years. For example, I participated in the Swiss LSD study. 12 patients were treated, treated which had life-threatening diseases as terminal cancer, etc. It was a double-blind placebo-controlled study, sent psychotherapy session in a conventional format, drug-free, each 60 minutes were given, and to LSD session with quite a higher dose. Two therapists were present, and we had a post-session and follow-up evaluations. And uh, here is the main therapist, Dr. Gasser in Solothurn in Switzerland, with the patient. And you know that LSD can induce these fantastic visions, and also, give, also can give you deep insights into yourself. And what you can see here, I have not much time to present details, but this is um, um, a special instrument, which was the first, uh, the first important thing uh, to measure. It was a so-called state trait anxiety inventory, and you have to realize that you have two kinds of anxiety which you measure with that instrument. Uh, one is the state anxiety, so the anxiety you have right now, this day, you know, and the trait anxiety is the anxiety chronically, so to say, inherent in your character. Right, so you have two things. Usually, all these therapeutic methods just change the state anxiety, not the trait anxiety. What we have found with the LSD-assisted psychotherapy is that the state anxiety goes down, and even after a year later, it's still on that very low level, so the people are not anxious anymore beyond this here. In the conventional sense, and what was also found, and that was really an uh, interesting thing for the psychiatric profession, is that even the trait anxiety is going down, and even that holds for a year or more. So <coughs> what are the psychological mechanisms of that kind of therapy? It is a really deep-reaching experience with a lot of access to your emotions, which are usually uh, rest under the surface, so, so to say. You also have cathartic experiences where you might cry or laugh or whatever. Um, what we have seen regularly is a change of the basic emotions. So the basic emotion, if you have terminal cancer, is fear and anxiety and isolation. So this is quite a different deal when they changed during the experience. There were also kind of mystical experiences going on and altered associations in that sense that you see things from a completely different angle and this might lead to uh, changes in perspectives, attitudes, and your views of life and yourself and yourself with the illness. <clears throat> 
now we come to psilocybin, which is known to be in the, the main ingredient in magic mushrooms. It's a very old uh, cultish drug uh, used uh, thousands for, uh, for thousands of years. It works mainly on a specific sub-receptor of the serotonin receptor populations in the brain. It um, goes on by um, activating your limbic system, which is your feeling centers in your brain, and th also the frontal cortex is activated. There are also uh, changes of connectivity in between the brain centers, which usually work together to, to uh, go on with a certain task. Uh, and there's also uh, an enhancement of emotions. You could think of by the limbic system activated. There's a lot of imagery going on, different associations and memory. Uh, important is that you have clear consciousness and you have clear memory about these events which you experience during the uh, drug action. And the newest study with that, there are a lot of studies going on right now with psilocybin. It seems to be the new uh, thing in, in our profession even. And uh, the, uh, the a main study which had a lot of impact because it was done by the leading psychopharmacological researcher of the whole world, which is Professor Nutt in London. And it was a feasibility study in, 40, um, in um, 24 patients. They had a few preparatory psychotherapy sessions and then two s sessions with psilocybin, one with a low dose, one with a higher dose. There were some integration sessions and a follow-up for six months. And the results, oh. <laughs> How is that? No, it's not working, so it shows, yeah, <laughs> depressed, so to say. Um, okay, so what you can see here is that the, pre the patients start, okay, let's say here, they start here and they usually go down that way, but later on they go up with their depression scores again because they had no so-called after treatment. If you would embed these uh, opening up of the people into a longer psychotherapy process, it might be worth it to give you a longer betterment. And these were also patients which were treatment resistant, and uh, so th uh, the psychiatric profession, or parts of it, are full of hope that these medications might help these patients which are uh, having a grave condition. So how is that? Very good, huh? So, okay, this is not my fault. And what I want to present you here is usually you can see a brain here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's not that way, but we still have the animation somewhat. And this, uh, so if you would imagine this is one half of the brain, this is the other half. So you see, you see it from above, okay? And so this is a primitive um, equivalent of a kind of network of parts of the brain's working brain in the brain working together. Right? So usually you have a certain, uh, certain nets, net networks going on. Um, you could imagine these are two of the networks. What we know, what happens in depression is that the networks get tighter in themselves. But the connectivity in between the networks is getting less. Okay? So what happens if you give a person psilocybin? This was dis discovered before they gave the patient the stuff. It was discovered in uh, healthy humans and which is that all the networks are connecting with each other and they are much more loose in themselves for these few hours. And afterwards, the people are out of their depression in, the, in respect to the networks. You can see the uh, healthy network density, so to say, and connectedness. So that is the... <laughs> how, however, so um, to come to the last uh, slides, uh, what, uh, for what conditions is psilocybin right now used in scientific uh, studies worldwide, which is anxiety with life-threatening distress, what I talk, told you about with the LSD trials, but it is used with psilocybin too. Some of these results are already published. Obsessive compulsive symptoms of people which have these kind of repeated behaviors which they don't want. Cigarette addiction with high success rates of 90% plus. Alcoholism, also very high success rates. That was already tried in the 1960s, but was finished because of the illegalization. And we also have phase two, phase three trials going on, which are kind of the way on to, to marketing. And these are the last phases you have to go through until you can market a drug. This is the same with the cancer, anxiety, and depression. There we have phase three trials in the US, and these are going on in Europe right now. And so this seems to be the future of psychopharmacology. If you look at the past, this is my last slide, 
um, and you look at the development of uh, psychopharmacology in the different decennia, you will see that uh, at first they discovered the tranquilizers. Opium is also a tranquilizer, so they have known that for quite a while, but these were more specific. Then during the 1950s, they showed up with the antidepressants uh, and left all the other medications then alone. Then during the 1950s, neuroleptics to treat psychotic symptoms like with schizophrenia were developed. And in the 1960s, as you might know, anxiolytic like Valium, etc., came up. Then during the next, uh, no, in the 1960s, there was also quite a bit of research, hundreds of publications about the therapeutic use of hallucinogens, the technical term for LSD, MDMA, LSD. And um, so, then there was also some research into stimulants for treating depression and other disorders. And right now, you see in the 1970s, we had not much development, the, uh, but the amphetamines were out of uh, fashion. The hallucinogens were out of fashion because they, they, don't, they don't think they were usable anymore. But during the 1990s and later on, we learned that uh, quite a bit of these conventional medications are not really good. So we, at first we left the anxiolytics, then we left the tranquilizers, then we left the antidepressants for no, being not effective as much. Now we know that neuroleptics make people unable to cope with their illnesses, so they are also very problematic right now. And what we can see is since 2010, the hallucinogens like LSD and uh, psilocybin are coming up again in psychopharmacology. And the same is true not for the stimulants, but in a certain sense, the MDMA and the like are kind of stimulants, what we call antactogens, because they are different from amphetamine. And so you can see that might be the future of psychiatry and helping psychotherapy and all these ill patients. Thanks for your attention. All right, I think we have time for one quick question. Uh, let's, let's see what we got. Uh, what's your position on LSD microdosing to boost creativity at work? Should I answer? Uh, I have okay. no answer for this. Yeah, to tell, you the truth, uh, yeah. to tell you the truth, if you look in the internet for the book, The Science of Microdosing, I've written that and put it all the results together up to now. And um, in respect to creativity, from a scientific point of view, there were two kinds of studies done in the past with LSD, psilocybin, etc. cetera. Uh, one where with high dose, they showed some little effects on creativity boosting. And the uh, scientific studies with the lower doses haven't shown any uh, every uh, good results, uh, even more negative results. But we have to be careful because the scientific setting is sometimes not really uh, creativity boosting. You know, like sitting there on a computer and doing something there and looking out for divergent thinking or lateral thinking, stuff like that. So if you look at people which are really painting or really playing music, you might find some better effect. But microdosing, it could be that it did not work. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you.